No doubt that's the biggest change for the industry. And uh, we have, I think, we all have no idea how powerful the impact is and how quick the changes will be coming around the corner. Hello and welcome to CEO Connection, a podcast brought to you by the CEO Magazine. I'm your host and CEO of the CEO Magazine, David Jepson. In this show, we want to share with you the human behind the company, the figure behind the figurehead role. Being a CEO means you have to shoulder a lot of responsibilities and are seen as the extension of the company that you take care of. In this podcast, we hope to shine a light on the humanity behind some of the most successful businesses across the globe by allowing leaders to share their personal journey towards success. Welcome to today's episode, where we're joined by Oliver Finstervalde, the outgoing CEO of DVH Media. After an incredible 15 years at the helm, Oliver recently made the decision to step down, transitioning leadership to his successor, Andrea Vazmuth. Today, we'll be diving deep into the challenges and opportunities that come with a CEO handover, the importance of clear communication during such a pivotal process, and the key lessons Oliver has learned that will shape his future career. Any change creates opportunity. A change in CEO is no different. Get it right, and companies can propel to the next level. Get it wrong, and the very future of the company can be in jeopardy. Welcome to the show, Oliver. For those listeners outside of Germany who may not know a lot about DVH Medium, could you just give us a brief summary of the business and your personal journey to becoming the CEO? Of course. Uh, well, our group just hosts some major German media brands, uh, such as Sunspot, the Platzbohrer, Zeit, and Tagesspiegel. And we, we cover with these media the number one positions in the relevant segments of finance, business, politics, and society. And so we are able to concentrate all our business activities uh, of publishing and of advertising on these high-level target groups of those four media brands. In our group, we also host the number one quality media advertising company and uh, many different relevant uh, event units. So at the end, it's all about content, uh, focusing on, on relevant content, which gives the target groups uh, added value and uh, concentrate on subscription business and on advertising uh, as well. And my personal journey was a little bit... Uh, uh, funny in some way i just got in touch with our shareholder uh dita dita von Alsbank, uh, when i was a consultant uh, when he first stepped off his former international media group and handed that over to his um to his sister and his brother uh, he just needed somebody who is caring for his family office so he found me and i was just at the beginning uh, being a consultant for him. Then he jumped back into the media industry, buying back uh, the relevant media brands again and uh, running them by his holding company. And at the beginning, I was just some kind of outsourced uh, CFO, still being the consultant and uh, caring for his private issues, but also then caring for all the financial issues of the new established media group. But still as a consultant, after a few years, he just asked me, well, don't you want to just jump fully into the media industry and uh, become a manager of my holding? I immediately say, said yes, I did have a new contract from him, but I terminated my old contract and uh, jumped into it and it was all based on on trust to him especially and uh, at the beginning I was just learning about the new industry and carrying for all the financial issues and then over the time it was just a shift to from CFO also to CEO it was just a process 
it just happened over the time and that's what i'm doing now since 15 years you, you talked about the trust that existed between you and the and the owner and i think that's so vital for any executive to to build that trust whether it's with shareholders private owners how did you go about building that trust over those years well it was it just happened in some way but uh, i agree it's it it is a major uh, aspect if if there is that deep trust in reverse um uh, then it's much easier to to uh, work hand in hand to listen to each other and uh, just to act because that was key for me always. So I always felt that I can always immediately act knowing that he's always standing a hundred percent behind me. It's really a great character in in letting you know if there's a problem. Uh, I stand behind you and then I just uh, focus on how we get it solved. That was one major aspect why I said yes to him immediately and we, we agreed on me becoming a manager of his holding company by a handshake. And um, probably it was based on the family office issues. I was from the beginning on involved in very private and uh, delicate issues and he trusted mm -hmm. me that I'm caring for them very well mm -hmm. and so over the time it was not just a business relationship it was just uh, he's a, a great character can learn from him he's just uh, open a very open mindset uh, um, listening to other people and reflecting on that and then I think we both realized so oh, that matches in some way and uh, very quickly and that was it and you made the very i guess big and important decision to step down as the the ceo after after so many years can you tell us a bit about what motivated that decision and you want for that change yeah of course about it started with a private decision or feeling uh, just several years ago it was i think it was 2018 or 2019 when i realized well probably you know, it's a good idea to open my horizon or keep it open uh, on the long run and just take care that it's not covered with my my business my media focus uh, only and uh, so I thought I have to create a master plan to hand over uh, step by step and uh, to to uh, organize everything quite well for the company, but also for my, me and myself. And but then Corona came around the corner. Uh, it hit uh, also our industry and our company, and so it was not the moment to reflect on. Uh, private <laughs> motivations uh, on master plans so I put it aside again and uh, 2022 I, I jumped into that idea again reflected deeply on it again and that was the starting point to to organize everything that uh, I'm able to hand over the CEO position by end of the year now and uh, jump into the board but create so much more space for my private life for and for other interests. Uh, and I'm very looking forward to that period now. I'm really excited that we get to talk about this topic today. You're going to share with us um, what that handover process has, has looked like for you personally and for the business. And I think it's a really important discussion uh, to be having looking at some of the data particularly on ceo turnover it's a really important issue for businesses um, there's studies that show ceo turnover in the us in 2023 was up 55 percent as compared to 2022 at major corporations we see similar figures in europe so right now this is a very important issue for businesses um, we're also seeing generally shorter tenures 
uh, more CEOs who are in the role for one and a half to two years. If we move forward now into the transition process for you and the business, what were what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced in preparing for the handover process? There were three key issues. Uh, the first thing was I had to assure that I was convinced myself that this is the correct step yeah. uh, because it was clear it was really a one-way discussion. You can't start that discussion with your shareholder and mentor and then realizing, oops, probably it was the best <laughs> idea and uh, just forget everything I, I talked about. And it was also, I think, important that I knew I'm, I'm deeply convinced for myself uh, that is correct decision, a good decision, but also to have ideas uh, how it could become a super move also for the company and for him as a shareholder. Because uh, in the discussion then, he immediately realized or soon realized it's not only a, a decision in the in a sit special situation. He really reflected about the situation. And uh, I think that also helped them for my the first step, discussing it uh, with my shareholder and introducing him to that idea that he realized, oh, he's convinced about it uh, himself. And uh, then the, the second major key aspect was to convince him this is a good idea or also could create a win-win situation. Um, even though he tried to convince me at the beginning not to hold on to that master plan idea. And he always... Uh, double checked and challenged me on that uh, over the time uh, i think he wanted to make sure that i uh, really was uh, aware of <laughs> what process i i started now but convincing him and starting an open discussion with him what could be the benefit of doing it now i think he expected that this discussion coming around the corner 10 years or 15 years later mm. I think he realized, well, it's, and he said, I have to say thanks to you opening that idea so early on the, on the table because it uh, allowed me as a shareholder to design together with you as the outgoing CEO to design the future. I think that was the benefit he realized uh, very quickly. And the third key aspect was uh, to create a master plan on the timeline. Because I started the discussion with him quite early, uh, 2022, and uh, it was focused from beginning on, on mid or end of 2024. So we do have a long period uh, to reflect on that, but also to create a master plan on the timeline. Who has to be involved at what point of time? And I think having enough time to reflect about that was also very, very helpful to create at the end a smooth and, and overall process. So, so there we focused obviously very much on the conversation with the, the owner. And I imagine it was very important that, like you say, he could see the, the bigger picture for both you and the business and that actually this was in the interest of of both parties i guess how that, that's how you maintain that strong relationship and the trust you talked about before because what can often happen when uh, people uh, let their employees know that they're going to leave you can immediately get a breakdown in trust how did you communicate that vision to the owner and what advice would you give to other execs who are in a similar position and want to, to, to do the same thing and, and keep that trust in place? Well, uh, to be honest, I was also, oh, I prepared myself uh, that he could uh, react like saying, okay, noted, but uh, then it's a immediate exit. Yeah. Sorry, you, you uh, disappoint me now. 
and I uh, didn't expect that. We never talked about it. Sorry for that, but it's a it's a immediate break. I didn't expect it from him, but you never know. Yeah. And so uh, all I wanted to prevent is not to disappoint him and giving the comfort that it's there's not only a, a plan B solution, but that it's uh, reflecting about it and then designing options uh, gives him and the company and me the option to design it probably even better and uh, uh, start with some different changes, not only probably uh, on, on the management level on the on the holding company, but probably reflecting about should we now jump into internal also uh, developing the board, which we at the end now do. Yeah. So my advice is just if you are in the blessed position like I was, that there is such a, a trustful relation relationship, uh, just be open. For me, I was dealing with that idea since years. Uh, when I started it, uh, when I first laid it on the table uh, to my my shareholder, um, I expected that he immediately understands my situation and my thoughts because to me it was a <laughs> long developed idea. Uh, then I realized, oops, uh, I must give him time to reflect and to come back again, and again and again, and to to, to also step back in the discussion what we already have discussed because he needs time to jump into that idea and so it's if it's possible to not to be under pressure on the timeline i think that's that's mm. always a uh, good advice and uh, that's how it worked so that's making making very clear to the the shareholder that this is my decision however i'm prepared to to take the time to to do yeah, this explain the decision explain yeah. the reason uh, i think it was helpful that he understood my motivation yeah and uh, i think that's that's helpful in such a situation yeah let's talk about some of the other stakeholders so i'm particularly thinking about perhaps the management team who who report to you. Obviously, they've worked with you for, for many years. And I imagine they're a key part of the transition process going forward. How did you communicate this decision to them um, to ensure transparency and, and clarity? It, it was a little bit, that was just one, one challenge to... to uh agree with the shareholder on what time, what moment on the timeline we, we introduce the, the, the key team uh, to that idea. And uh, I'm convinced, of course, can't be too early, can't be three or four years before it happens. But too late is also a problem. So find the perfect balance. And uh, then I just try to reflect on what's their need on information at that moment mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's totally different to uh, or was totally different to uh, to each of them we tried to cover the most important aspects uh, and uh, i just introduced it to the the holding team uh, all together we came all together and then i offered them the following days just for face-to-face -face discussions. Each of the group just knocked on my door and said, well, just give me a few moments to understand mm -hmm. and uh, listen to them and, and uh, be there, uh, be available. I think that was necessary. And also explain it. And uh, I think at the end, everybody understands private motivations after 15 years uh, leading a uh, group like ours in in those discussions with the management team as they learned you were going from being the the long-term stable ceo to the now outgoing ceo were there any any things you learned in conversations with people that perhaps you hadn't seen before i think the bigger thing is uh, you have to communicate as clear as possible 
everything that the key changes should be very clear uh, who follows you what is the timeline uh, uh, you should prevent that uh, there's the team or members of the team are never in between uh, to the outgoing and the new CEO in that situation it's it's never enough listening <laughs> you could always listen a little bit more and uh, I think that's the key aspect listen to uh, the team and the team members uh, what are their needs and uh, be there if there are questions completely I guess it goes back to what you said before about communication and um, being able to be clear about what the change means for each person um, but I always find communication is it's more of an art form than a than a science and I guess yeah like like I say if if people have those questions especially in a moment of big change it's good to be able to to answer those to remove that uncertainty but it's not always possible I guess to answer everybody's questions oh but it's uh it's you should communicate in a way that they know they are part of the process and uh, it, it's only a good uh, team situation if you also allow them to add some ideas or to how to adjust the, the big decision the, give them enough space and the process enough space to adjust it to their needs that they they feel they are part of the process i think that's that's uh helpful and it's fair enough <laughs> and before having those conversations um i presume you and the owner had done quite a lot of work already on planning the transition process what were some of the things that you were able to communicate very clearly in those conversations with your team and what were some of the areas where perhaps you needed to have those conversations with the team to be able to then build them into the transition process it was a little bit a timeline but that was a little based on on the situation that i was uh, uh, emotionally and from the, the preparations uh, already in the outgoing situation and we wanted to make it very smooth and not that it's a shock moment or whatever so uh, we had to be flexible on the timeline listening to the needs and that was what we adjusted over the period of, of communication a little bit uh, not dramatically but a little bit and uh, in parallel uh, we have a special situation that we, we Michelle, uh, we just said um, probably it's also the, the best moment to also develop the board. Not only because I'm jumping into the board too. It was clear Michelle asked me to, to become the chairman of the board. Mm. But uh, he immediately understood that does, that does match with the master plan, <laughs> with my motivation. And uh, so we, we designed together the the new setting in the board we, we communicated all changes uh, in, in one moment so um, I think that was uh, I think it was very clear with regard to the change and the handing over period uh, of the CEO position yeah. because Andrea is, is following me uh, she's she's in charge of one of our subgroups the Hansbad Media Group and she's just phenomenal uh, great character extremely experienced could be better so I'm sure she will do my job much better than I did it <laughs> it was a little bit unclear about the process of handing over chairman of board uh, from the existing chairman to uh, his further and uh, almost co-chairman that was the bigger issue for the people to understand that this happens in peril and uh, so we had two areas to communicate and about and uh, uh, to make the people understand i, I guess it, it helped uh, that the incoming ceo is someone who's already well known within the 
within the group so it removes some of those questions about you know what does the future look like because this person's already known absolutely absolutely that's i think that's a big bonus for such a the whole situation it's it's not possible uh, always or really it's it's a rare situation but of course that helped dramatically yeah and i think it was also helpful that uh, we both are just working together uh, since years very well and also very trustful the, the people realize that they feel it they saw it we are uh, both uh, in a good uh, situation and both happy about that and i think that gave the uh, the, the whole company situation of comfort and uh, made it much easier i think it's a good sign for the health of an organization that it can bring through executives one it's great for it's great for the employees because they can see that career path happening in in front of them um but two it shows that you're developing your people to the point where not only like you've very openly said not only could this person potentially do the role but they may even be able to do it in a way that helps drive the company further forward so i think that's a it's a great credit to yourself and and the organization that you've achieved that i think so yeah and and have great talents super talents and just give them uh the the, the options to develop themselves and and uh, it's it's i think a necessary uh, way to to motivate the people if you allow them to to also make new experiences and just to try things that everything works well to go back reflect what was the problem and to learn from it that kind of culture is so helpful to give those great characters uh, the options and uh, yeah it's, it's I, i'm really convinced that that's the best situation now we we are having from first january next year on you talked about what is your experience uh, on that process uh, probably that's also one experience uh, don't just immediately look to external uh, characters probably it's always good first first <laughs> take first uh, what characters you have in your your group and trust them and uh, give them space to develop themselves we've we've talked a lot in this conversation about perhaps some of the challenges of a transition process what have you found the most rewarding about this experience a lot is about timing and um we are, well, we are in, a, in a industry which loves to communicate especially the secrets uh which is not helpful but uh, uh if you involve the people based on trust then you will be surprised uh, how good it works and uh, i think it's all about transparency and communication clear decisions and uh, uh, giving the people the comfort of uh, that it's uh, uh, key characters are all on the same page now looking back or looking on the tent over process seeing how it works very well much quicker and uh, older than expected uh is is uh, just simple to see that uh, we are extremely relaxed on the on the last period of the year uh, before i finally hand it over but uh, it nearly happens now it's just a, a formal thing for me now we know the the accessor is uh Andrea Vasmuth what what role has she played in ensuring a seamless handover and what does that look like between now and January the 1st she she plays played a major role because uh 
Well, at the moment you communicate that surprising change like that, um, people are just just for a second focused on the outgoing person, but within a second they reflect uh, about uh, the new setting and uh, the new person who is in charge, which is normal and good. It was the most important thing how she acted. She was. Uh, um, available for everybody to talk about needs and thoughts and uh, she was very clear from the beginning on that she follows our strategic uh, uh, way but that she's open to adjust things or to uh, that she, she her focus is a little bit different than to my focus was so um, giving the people comfort she she had to be available, which she was, and uh, she invested a lot of time in face to face discussions. I think uh, that was important that she immediately was available and not just a name and not, not uh, 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 communicating what her focus is. That was also part of our deal or whatever. Uh, that um, I step back from the moment on when it's communicated. I don't take decisions anymore which have an impact uh, on the period when she's in charge. Mm. So so she was able to act in the new role from the moment on when she was, uh, when it was uh, when public. Yeah. And I think that was also very helpful. And again, I think that says a lot for your own character as well Oliver I can imagine there's probably been CEOs in the past who are in a transition period but ego can come into play they still want to make certain decisions um, that can affect the next person but the fact that you were able to you know see that so clearly and work so collaboratively is only going to make the chances of her being successful higher I don't think that's the biggest problem if you are outgoing uh, but if you are convinced you sh sh uh, should monitor uh, the team or the process uh, and, and the decisions um, still for a longer period, being a, a co-CEO or something like that, I think that's the, the, the biggest fault you can do. And probably it's a different situation if it's your own decision to hand over or if you are forced to hand over, I think yes. that could be totally different. Yes. So it was very easy for me because I was, I'm very looking forward to the change. Yeah. And, uh, but of course that makes it easier for her. Yeah. It completely goes to the, the beginning of, you know, where we started on the reasons for the change and the reasons that you, you made the decision yourself, which is always going to make that process far easier. So we've, um, We've covered a lot of ground in this conversation and I'd love us just to try and pick out, I guess, some key learnings or key key messages that we can give to the audience. So what advice would you give to other CEOs who are planning a handover, especially in a family-owned business? Well, uh, I think that's a special situation. Uh, normally, family-owned businesses are um, not open to communicate. We talked about a lot about communication. Uh, don't want to repeat that, but it's it was really helpful that uh, our shareholder was convinced that communication is a key aspect. And uh, so uh, to, to make sure that the stakeholders uh, regard um, a clear communication, and the communication that happens early enough, and that gives... Uh, for that reason, the people at the company enough time to get comfortable with the new situation. That such a communication is not a risk; it's a it's a big chance. Don't let us that super chance pass in such a process. So it's all about communication that all the stakeholders are on the same page. I think that's that's uh, the key aspect, and be transparent. Uh, to, to the teams 
Um, that's one of the, from my point of view, uh, when I was a former business life consultant, I saw it so often that uh, there was a long period without a clear cut. It was the people were just in between the way in the sandwich because uh, it was just a too long period of unclear positions and roles and make sure that this is uh, from moment, one moment to another. Uh, but that also means that uh, the outgoing person does must not only be the CEO, it can be on all levels of management. The outgoing person has to really to step back and to hand over and uh, discipline himself, uh, uh, himself not to jump back into a co-position for a while. I think that's biggest advice if, if you manage such a handover uh, situation if you're uh, you're part of that handover situation discipline yourself and make the handover really clear and make it happen what have you learned oliver about leadership in particular from this this experience well uh, what i didn't expect at the beginning in my role as a ceo as a leader as a manager uh, you have to find a good balance between democracy and dictatorship <laughs> in some way uh, we, we talked about uh, our values uh, we have in our group and it's all our teamwork because you as a leader or manager, you're nothing without mm -hmm. your team. Uh, you can take decisions, but you can't execute them and you need the input from all of your team members. Uh, yeah. uh, but that's the one side. The other side of the medal is uh, it needs in some situations uh, dictatorship, clear decisions. And finding there always the best uh, balance, I think that was uh, one of my learning curves over the years. Yeah. Are there any particular examples you can think of where perhaps you could have been more dictatorial, let's say, as opposed to um, working with a team and, and vice versa? Are there any particular times you can remember? Yeah, I've, well, we had several situations where... I should have been more dictator. Uh, when we invested too much time to uh, convince uh, management in the subgroups to fo follow another idea or another mm -hmm. road, uh, even if we were convinced they are running the wrong direction, and uh, we tried to convince them that, that it's better to follow our idea or preferences our uh, to to adjust their route and uh, we lost too much time on that so it, it's of course you should uh, follow a higher and fire mentality that's definitely wrong from my point of view but uh, not waiting too long and wasting too much time and energy in, in uh, such situations and being a little bit earlier dictator yeah. in such situations. And we had many of such situations, I must yeah. admit. I, I, I think of some experiences I've had where I want to give, you know, give staff as much freedom to explore and make mistakes. However, sometimes if you ask people to come up with ideas or decisions when actually they don't have all the information or the training they need to make those decisions properly ultimately you're going to to fail and sometimes failure i mean failure is inevitable right and it's often how people learn but some failures i guess it's our job as the exec to to try and minimize um the amount of failure where possible yeah i think that's that's a all uh, thing to, to create a culture in your company where you can fail because uh, especially with new developments, uh, digitalization, every, every process of transmission, um, is, is there are absolutely unknown areas. You have to explore them and you need 
uh, the power and the ideas of all people um, running your business. So and, and they only do it and uh, act like entrepreneurs if they know they can fail. I feel it would be a missed opportunity for me if I didn't ask you a bit about the media industry in particular. See, someone who's been, you know, running such an influential group over the last 15 years. There's a lot of talk about media, its role within society, particularly in the Western world. What, what's, what's the future for media? What are some of the key trends that, that you've identified and that you hope the group can um, exploit, I guess, in the coming years? I think uh, important for us um, uh, are the values in the society and we have uh, regard our media as, as uh, being important for, for society even more now. Uh, AI, that's definitely one of the big drivers in the, in the future. Artificial intelligence is a big challenge, but also extremely positive chance for media companies. I think probably it's the biggest change, uh, biggest disruption we were faced with, um, but it should be regarded as, as a big chance that we are able to focus on, on the things we can create added value and not on the things which are easier done by technology. So, so we are not afraid of that, but we are uh, aware that we know probably 10% of what is coming around the corner, what are the options and, and chances and the challenges. And again, you, we are convinced that uh, it's our job as a manager just um, to, to enable the people and all the people who work in our companies to understand and to act with that new technology because we need all the creative uh, ideas uh, on all levels to make sure that uh, on each level of the company it's all about entrepreneurship I think if you follow that idea, uh, then it's a big positive impact. But we have to be aware of of what happens with that new uh, level of technology, because not every every development is just positive. You have to act with that very responsible. Uh, but no doubt, that's the biggest change for the industry. For most of the industries, but also for the media industry. And uh, we have, I think, we all have no idea how powerful the impact is and how quick the changes will be coming around the corner. Yeah. The, the, the media industry in particular, as, as content becomes a lot cheaper to produce, easier to produce, faster to produce through AI, how... how and again, as similar with any with other industries, programmers um, programming is becoming a lot more accessible. Um, you could you could keep sort of going down the list. How how do you as a business maintain a a brand and a value add in a world with AI? So if we look at media, the media industry in particular, but but is that is that a, a big big chance? We regard it as we, we, we can't stop that development, uh, that, that situation, and we shouldn't stop it because uh, it doesn't make sense if technology can make things uh, cheaper, more productive, or whatever. Uh, let's concentrate on what AI can't do better. And uh, from our point of view, especially high quality media brands, they, what is their added value? The added value is not just to create content, but to, to give orientation, to bring things together. Of course, we are sure that there will always be a need for additional know-how, knowledge, and uh, probably we, we have uh, to work hand-in-hand together, not only with other media companies, but 
with uh, technology companies or whatever. But uh, uh, we regard it as a big chance and to focus on what we can do better. Added value content for special target groups. Um, we are sure that there will be not only a niche, but a, a wide area for media brands like like ours. And uh, but it's it's also it's we have to enable the, the all the people uh, in our groups uh, to also develop their mindset, uh, realize, be self-reflected on what could be better in the health of technology and what's your uh, added value part yeah completely thank you that was some really good insight I, I imagine we could probably do a whole podcast just talking about that uh that topic <laughs> on its own <laughs> but um as we as we start to draw to a close here looking back at your tenure as ceo what are you most proud of and how do you hope you'll be remembered for the work that you've done i think proud being proud is a uh, the wrong wording it's just it's all about teamwork i just have one role or had one role over the last 15 years or nearly 15 years and uh, i was just proud of a big team nothing without the team so uh, during my term the biggest crisis which came around the corner extremely unexpected with corona uh, we, that we sorted that quickly and we managed it uh, together in a way that we are much stronger uh, after corona than we were before we doubled our net income over that Spirit and uh, we're just holding on. It was just like a, we were able to speed on in the transmission yeah. process we have already been. And I'm just happy that that worked so well. And what what advice? I'm sure you've already you know you've already done this and will continue to do it. But what's some of the key pieces of advice that you've or you will give to Andrea, who's coming in and taking over the role? Really, to be honest, I think she doesn't need my advice. She's so experienced, and uh, we are from the culture on the on the same page. She knows the owner since years. She she knows uh, the subgroups. She she is uh, deeply involved in the industry, and I, I think she has a much stronger network than I have. She's uh, closer to the customers than I was in the last few years. Uh, she's extremely strategic thinking, but also uh, close to the market. And so I, I don't feel myself to be in a position to give her an advice. <laughs> to be honest, I think it's, it's uh, in best hands. And uh, so I, the only thing I would uh, tell her is just, just do it. Final question is what's next? What's next for Oliver? We know you'll be taking a position on the board. Um, tell us a bit about what you're, what you're going to be spending your time doing next year. Well, um, the the in the center of the master plan was the idea to create more space, Michael, uh, my, my private life, uh, just having more time for family and friends. My wife and me, we just have some some. Uh, ideas about charity activities and about private investments which we already started but uh, never had time to to uh, jump more into that and uh, traveling so rebalancing a little bit private life um, we are not sitting on the beach and just looking at the sea for the next 10 years uh, that's the, not how we work, but uh, there are plenty of other interesting things beyond media industry, and I'm just uh, very looking forward to step by step jump into that. Fantastic! Well, congratulations on a long tenure in the CEO role. As we said before, all the trends point to 
that position becoming a shorter uh, term, the fact you've been able to do the role for so long speaks volumes about you. And it clearly comes across here how sort of humble and open-minded you are. And yeah, I have no doubt that both you and the business will be extremely successful in your next steps. So thank you. Thanks to you. Great pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity to join your podcast. And there we have it. Our conversation with the CEO of DVH Media, Oliver Finsterwalde. It was really interesting to hear Oliver talk about the way he's built relationships with key stakeholders over the last 15 years. Oliver's clearly a very humble individual, but it's very apparent to me from the conversation the huge role he's played in building that business and that culture within the business over the last 15 years. Find out more about the DVH Median brands at handelsblatt.com, zeit.de, vivo.de, targspiegel.de, and dvhventures.de. If you enjoyed this episode of CEO Connection, brought to you by The CEO Magazine, make sure to subscribe to keep up to date with future episodes. If you're looking for more exclusive interviews with the people behind the world's largest brands, make sure to check out The CEO Magazine at theceomagazine.com. I'm David Jepson. Goodbye.